afternoon hearings with HB 1526 FN. Representative Carl Cash will introduce the bill for Representative Bennett. Right. Yeah. Representative Jackson, please begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, esteemed colleagues. This bill, as introduced, it provides that any person who possesses less than one ounce of marijuana, including any adulterants or pollutants, shall be guilty of a violation and shall be subject to a fine of up to $100. That pretty much sums it up. It effectively decriminalizes simple possession of marijuana under one ounce. Any questions? Thank you. Oh, that, that's going to come. Thank you. Let's ask, are there any other states in New England that have similar legislation? There are plenty of other states, uh, Maine, uh, Vermont, Mass. Uh, sky is not falling. Do you have any uh, data in regards to what they have done and what their crime rate has become afterwards? I do not have that data. Can you get that for us? Mm -hmm. I'll see what I can do. What you doing? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Since I don't smoke marijuana, I don't know how much an ounce is. is that a lifetime supply? Is it a one hour supply? Could give us an idea if that's you know, how that relates to personal use. Thank you for the question, Representative. Uh, personally, I would estimate about 20, 20 uh, good size joints could be rolled with one ounce of marijuana. Oh, so normal for personal use, let's say recreation. Probably be a two week supply for having use. Two weeks to Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Oh, absolutely. Did I have that? Uh, did you submit an amendment to this bill? Or I did. Uh, amendment 548H. How does it change the bill? Uh, the amendment I introduced, I don't want to toot my own horn here, but I like to think it's a perfect compromise between current law and what was originally introduced. Uh, it's a three three tier uh, approach. The first violation is subject to a fine not to exceed two hundred fifty dollars and forfeiture of the marijuana, obviously. Second violation would be a fine not to exceed five hundred dollars, and a third violation and a subsequent violation would be a class A misdemeanor subject to a fine not to exceed one thousand uh, dollars. Under eighteen, it maintains the provision for a uh, drug awareness program. Uh, Chairman, wouldn't it be appropriate to address the amendment as well as the bill? It does change the entire bill. I welcome questions on the amendment. Okay. Uh, the amendment. Uh, available. I, I gave one to everybody at the end of the day. Oh. No, he didn't That's a good It is Amendment 0534H. I like to say that this committee, I often say it, this committee is one of the most important committees. And I say that because the decisions we make or the decisions we don't make affect people's lives for years to come. I think this change is going to affect people's lives for the better for years to come. Okay. I actually had took the liberty of printing out about thirty copies and put them in there. Okay. But I will I would love to bring them over here on the table for anyone. Okay. Are they in the room? Yeah, they're on the wall. Oh, there they are. <coughs> this would be Here's some more copies. So if anybody in the audience would like one. Okay. So, any comments or 
Representative Ginsburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative, uh, what's the rationale for making the cutoff age 18 rather than 21? Well, below, let me get to your question. Below 18, you feel comfortable compelling the individual to attend a uh, drug treatment program, but otherwise, it would say any person 18 years or older, and that would be it, or any person. If we didn't have the, the drug awareness program, we wouldn't even need, even need to specify age to say anyone. So there wouldn't be a cutoff age. The reason there's a cutoff age is because there's that drug awareness provision starting at the bottom of page one and going to page two. That affects the situation. Well, would you not feel comfortable compelling people uh, up to 21 years old to attend the program? I don't believe that as would be as we do with alcohol. So. I don't believe that would be appropriate in my experience, but you're welcome to amend that if you feel that that would improve the bill. Thank you. Thank you. For clarification for myself and maybe some members of the audience, is the idea of this bill to change it from the current status of, of marijuana possession being a, correct if I'm wrong, misdemeanor, a damage of violation? Can you explain to me the differences in the penalties between the way, way it is now and what this would be? Well, the uh, amendment maintains the misdemeanor for the third offense, and a misdemeanor can be punishable by up to a one year in jail or a $2,000 fine limit by statute. I reduced it to $1,000 fine for the third offense, as I felt the fines given out are generally three figures. So I, I felt that having it up to 2,000 disproportionately uh, was disproportionately high. You'll notice uh, Article 18, Part 1, listed on the on the back. It says all penalties ought to be proportionate to the nature of the offense. I tried to keep that to <coughs> and created this amendment. Thank you. Uh, you're on the bill. Although you're not on the amendment, you are yeah. on the bill. <coughs> are there any more questions? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Uh, permission to return to my seat if I quiet? <coughs> yes. Can you do that? Yes. <coughs> <coughs> For the record, I am Rick Watrous of Merrimack 12, Concord Wards 5, 6, and 7. And I'm supporting this bill because I believe making criminals out of citizens that possess less than an ounce of marijuana does more harm than good. Um, under the current law, if a citizen is caught with a joint, one single joint, they are subject to a $25,000 fine and could spend up to three years in jail. I believe the penalty does not fit the offense. Um, the imprisonment of our citizens under the existing law costs our counties rough, roughly $35,000 per person per year. This adds up quickly. That money could be much better spent than turning these people into potentially hardened criminals because they've just spent three years behind jail. <coughs> I believe that, uh, according to the fiscal note accompanying this, that the judicial branch would save money because of court costs involved in the current misdemeanor offenses. Uh, ma many states have already taken this common sense path. Research has shown that the dangers of marijuana have been greatly exaggerated. And in some ways, it's actually safer than alcohol and tobacco. So I think it's time to amend this law for the benefit of our citizens. Have you seen the amendment? No, I have not. There's one there in the corner. May save you some work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I got my question back again. Thank you, Rip. There, take my question. Um, <coughs> my only concern is: is how do we enforcement-wise? Okay, we have one example. Is all right. Somebody gets 
law enforcement officer finds somebody with one under <coughs> one ounce of marijuana. And he determined that that marijuana is not pure marijuana. There's other stuff in that marijuana. Would this bill fall underneath that? I believe the existing bill talks about alterants, you know, the other stuff. Um, and, I, and I haven't seen the amendment, so I can't speak to that. Any other questions? Thank you. Karen Edgel from the AG, AG's office. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Karen Eckel. I'm Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice uh, in the Criminal Bureau. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the Attorney General who opposes the bill. The um, Attorney General opposes the bill because the current law is clear and uh, enforceable. And keeping the law clear is important because studies have shown that, particularly youth, uh, perception of harm and the, the uh, legal sanctions, the perception that, that a person will suffer legal sanctions, does influence the initial decision of some uh, adolescents to use marijuana in the first instance. Uh, we believe that decriminalization laws um, send a confusing message to um, adolescents about the legal status of marijuana. Decriminalizing a certain amount of uh, possession and, and manufacture of a certain amount of marijuana uh, that is otherwise illegal to possess or sell in a larger amount is, is very difficult to understand, I think, and certainly from a law enforcement perspective, trying to ferret out decriminalization conduct, decriminalized conduct from criminalized conduct is, is made very, very difficult um, by uh, decriminalization laws, particularly in the driving context where under the current state of the law, the odor of marijuana alone is enough to justify further investigation um, into, into that criminal, potential criminal activity. Um, with a decriminalization scheme, that may very well change uh, the way officers can investigate uh, these crimes. It, there is a decision that was rendered recently in Massachusetts where the Superior, Supreme Judicial Court found that because they had decriminalized uh, a certain amount of marijuana, that the odor of marijuana uh, was in and of itself not enough to justify um, getting those individuals um, out of the car. Um, so certainly it, it is a difficult concept to apply and enforce. Also, as we all know, it's a federal crime to possess marijuana in any amount. So anybody who's on federal property within our state would, would still be subject to um, criminal uh, sanctions um, and for instance in a state park and we have many uh, would be subject to arrest um, by uh, law enforcement rangers. Um, another collateral consequence if this is passed into law um, it will preclude the state from filing uh, what we call um, juvenile petitions under RSA 169B uh, because marijuana possession in up to, less to, up to less than an ounce would no longer be considered a crime. And that would take those adolescents out of the, they would not qualify for otherwise uh, services under 169. Um, and they also, because the definition of children in need of services has also been um, redefined to a narrower place, they would not qualify under CHINS either. So those young people would um, fall through the cracks. And it, I think studies have shown that the best time to intervene uh, with young people who are uh, committing crimes is to, uh, especially where alcohol or marijuana is involved, early intervention is the most effective. Uh, the bill is written also treats trafficking, selling, or recruiting minors to sell less than one ounce of marijuana also as a violation level offense. Um, 
And I think I already mentioned the difficulties that the officers were encountering in the field uh, in enforcing uh, this, this type of uh, scheme. And for these reasons, the Attorney General urges you to reject um, House Bill 1526. And I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Representative Sherman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for your testimony today. I believe my friend, the representative from Crockett, said the penalty for possession of one joint would be up to $25,000. Is that correct? Here in New Hampshire? Yeah, that's what I, and I've gone through the law book and I can't find it. Possession of marijuana is, is always a Class A misdemeanor, no matter how many times. There's no subsequent uh, penalty or, or graduation of penalties. It's always um, a Class A misdemeanor, which would be a $2,000 fine maximum. And up to one year in jail maximum. Up to one, meal, up to one year in jail. But the law also permits uh, a prosecutor to uh, reduce a Class A to a Class B at any time. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Eckel, uh, how many of the other Attorney Generals in New England states do you communicate with about this? Um, I have personally not communicated with other attorneys general. Follow up. Yes. So is it safe to say that the, then there's been no outcry from the other Attorney Generals when they decriminalized as this bill comes on? Outcry in what way? That this will somehow create the situation that you described to us. Well, it, it may have occurred. I'm just not aware of it. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have written testimony? I do not. I think so. We would be to try. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a list of names here. Franklin, you initiate. Thank you. You said three minutes. Yes, Hopefully. we're going to go. Um, there's, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. My name is Shannon Lee. I am a youth advisor for the Franklin Youth Initiative. I'm also a health teacher at Franklin High School. Um, the youth, Franklin Youth Initiative, FYI, is um, in working with the Franklin Mayor's Drug Task Force. And I'm going to speak briefly just as a health teacher having worked in Franklin for five years um, in opposi opposition to this bill. Um, decriminalizing marijuana is sending a message that it is, is quote unquote a safe drug. Um, my experience in working at that high school as both a crisis counselor and a health teacher is that it, once you decriminalize it, um, <coughs> students, kids, teenagers um, lose that little bit of fear of what's going to happen if I, if I take that next step. We witness regularly issues with teenagers and alcohol, and alcohol also falls under that, that, that area from when the kids are 21 until you know, 16, 17, kids as young as 15 that are drinking. And how do you get them help? The reality is sometimes there's just not services in place. Um, budgets have been cut. Services aren't there to be able to provide um, what is necessary. And prevention, maintaining this as a misdemeanor, kind of is that first step in preventing kids from taking that step. Brains are growing until the age 21. Puberty officially ends at 21. I teach that in my health class. So their brain is developing. So decriminalizing it, making it a violation versus a misdemeanor, is inviting kids into to saying, OK, well, I speed in my car and I get a slap on her wrist. So what's going to happen when I pick up a drink? Um, I also would like to introduce uh, Megan Corning. She's one of um, my students and a member, our, actually our president of Franklin Youth. And she has a statement that she would like to read. Um, I'm a junior at Franklin High School and also president of the Franklin Youth Initiative. And I personally believe that the penalties do fit the nature of the crime. And that's because I know, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room know, that teenagers think that they are invisible. They're invincible. And they don't, the fear that keeps them from doing something is not what's going to happen to their bodies. It's punishment from their parents, prison, because teenagers will do anything as long as they can't see the harm. And teenagers can't see what's going on inside their bodies. And I wish all of you could spend a day at Franklin High School and you wouldn't know what I mean, because I'm on the bus 
I to school and I see at least five teenagers every morning either smoking cigarettes or whatever it is they're smoking. I see them sneak behind restaurants to buy, to sell, or to use. And the reason that I'm opposed to this bill is because if you've seen the things that I've seen, I don't classify it as a violation. I think it is a crime. I have lost people that are very close to my family because they do stupid things while they're high on marijuana. And they weren't under the influence of any other drug. And because there are drugs like meth and cocaine and heroin, they think that marijuana is okay because it's not as bad in comparison. And that may be true, but it is still very harmful to you. And teenagers don't understand that because they believe that they are invincible. And the damage that's going to their body, I know no matter what the law is, the effects of marijuana are still going to be the same. And that's not going to change who uses and who doesn't. It's the fear of what's going to be the punishment of their actions. Thank you. Okay. Anyone standing up behind you? Anyone of your youth uh, wishes to add to the testimony? That's what okay. I'm saying. Any questions? That's or? Right. <laughs> this is the first time for them. <laughs> this is, this, this, it's nice to see. Thank you. Yeah, question. Mr. Chairman, this man is the sponsor of the bill. <laughs> okay, who is next on the list? Representative Ginsburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would you feel more comfortable if, first of all, the uh, age at which, uh, below which it's required to send a person to a treatment program were raised to 21? Um, I'm not comfortable with the decriminalization, um, whether it's 21 or 18, because the programs for treatment are just not there. Um, I've had many people that are 21 that I have, that have since graduated and have come back that may or may not have, you know, had an issue, that have troubles because in a, in a community like Franklin, where, where a lot is rural, the closest treatment that you can get is in Laconia. And when you're in, you know, a low-income, you know, generational poverty town, transportation is a huge piece. So getting the transportation to go from Franklin to Laconia is, is difficult. It creates a hardship. Um, I noticed that in this bill, it talks greatly about treatment programs. I think if you're, you know, you're looking at decriminalizing something, you're looking at saying it's just a violation. Speeding is a violation. So I'm, I, I guess where, you know, whether the age is 18 or 21, that's up for you guys. As a teacher, as a mom, I have two teenagers, as the ad advocate for these guys here, I, I just think it should stay as a misdemeanor. Yes, um, Do you teach that uh, <coughs> alcohol is more or less dangerous than marijuana? I teach the use of alcohol and marijuana as equally dangerous. Um, when I present the, we call it the ATOG section of the health curriculum, alcohol, <coughs> tobacco, and other drugs, we teach that the actual effects, the physical effects of what marijuana and alcohol will do to your brain, what it will both do to your body. Um, <coughs> because alcohol is legal at age 21, I teach to the kids that you shouldn't drink it because your brain, you know, you shouldn't consume it. Your brain is developing, your body is developing, and studies show it starts, takes full seven years to become an adult from the time you start puberty. Um, so when I teach, I don't know if I'm answering this correctly, but when I teach it, I teach that both of them are dangerous and that they're both going to affect your brain development, it's going to affect your liver development. I teach it the same way. You're welcome. And I have, we brought um, some paperwork to, that talks about the effects of marijuana on the body and on teenagers. Representative Antos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. You're um, would you believe that anyone within this committee or on the House floor, no matter what law passes to make something legal or illegal, it will still be used by a person's choice whether it's legal or not. Do you, do you think that if this was to be decriminalized, that things would change? I do believe things would change. Um, because of my experiences as a, a teacher in Franklin and working with teenagers, 
I get the big debate, the big question all the time about, well, it should be decriminalized. In fact, that's one of the things that we do in class as a debate. You break up the class and they make an argument. One side is for and one side is against. Um, I, I do honestly believe that things would change and I think they would change greatly because the, the image that marijuana is a misdemeanor versus marijuana is an offense or a violation are two drastically different things in a teenager's mind because of the way that they think and that they process. Um, so the ones that are not using right now because it's a misdemeanor and you could go to jail and you could get a big fine, those kids will probably step back a little bit and say, well, it's like getting a speeding ticket and well, that's not as bad, so they are more likely to probably to try it. Um, and I've had conversations with kids where they're like, I will never do it because it's not good for you. And then I've had some that said, well, maybe if it wasn't uh, you know, illegal, then you know, I might try it. So I think as you take those steps and you, you, know, you turn it into a violation, that, that, yeah, you will see a change. Most teenagers have a curiosity to at least try something, whether they see it around them or see it, their parents using it. But from my personal experiences, what's keeping me from trying it is I know the effects it can do on your body, but the main thing for me is fear of punishment from my parents. Well, what would happen to me if I got caught? And I feel like that is the same for the other members in this group. And if the punishment, which is the fear that keeps a lot of people from having that curiosity, if that was lowered, it would greatly change the mindset of many youth. <coughs> Yes, I don't have a question. I would just like to thank the teacher for bringing it to me. Thank you. Thank you. Job. And I'd like to thank the young lady. She's been very impressive. Thank you. 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 Thank you fearful of what your parents might say or do, is that fear greater than the fear of the law? you fear the law more than you fear your parents? And Paula, for the, for the teacher. Yes. Now, let's say that one of the children behind you made the choice to partake, and they were caught. Should they have the opportunity to go on to college? Um, my understanding with the way that the financial aid works is that um, if they, if you are caught in possession, the, the drug and alcohol component to that is that it allows for the kids to go through treatment before they are then able to go ahead and process the applications and, and get financial aid. Yes. And if they had a subsequent incident and were banned from seeking uh, financial assistance to go to college, they would then uh, basically destroy the rest of their life by not being able to seek the education that they were initially trying to find. Is that um, according to my understanding of the financial aid regulations, that that is, is what they have in place. I think um, there are consequences for actions, natural consequences, and if you violate the law, that is the natural consequence um, as far as financial aid goes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have written testimony? Uh, we have some. May I just add something? Yes, yeah, you have a comment. A, a lot of people may think that we are just kids and we don't really know what we're talking about, but this is what we have to grow up in. Two of us are Tilton Police Explorers and we do what officers do. And it's very hard when we have kids saying, oh, can you hold my pot? Can you hold my cigarette? We have to grow up in this environment, all of us. And this soon, 20 years down the road, we're going to be. This is what our generation is. We need to make a living. We can't have marijuana being legal. This is just a step towards it being legal, and it's just, it's not going to work. If it's just a violation. And the reason that I'm more terrified of the law than my parents is because I know that a couple of years down the road, I'm almost to the point where I'm graduating high school, and I can have the choice whether I speak to my parents again. But the law can determine what I do with the rest of my life. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that there has been a generation that went through the same process with alcohol. Is that for any of us? For me? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't direct the question. Um, okay. Um, uh, 
the al uh, there was I know that there was issues with the alcohol. I know that the drinking age for alcohol was 18, and then it was 21. I know back in the 1920s there was the, the era of prohibition. Um, and having not lived during that time, having experienced you know from history, having been a teenager <laughs> a long time ago, but mainly working with teenagers, I, I see the issues with alcohol. I see the issues that teenagers and the accessibility for teenagers that get alcohol. Um, and with the change in the Chins laws, how it's di more difficult for the police to be able to get those kids help if they're caught in possession. Um, my, my, one of my fears with this bill is if you create a, um, turn this into a violation, you're adding another substance that is going to be more difficult to get help for kids. One more? Yes, thank you. One more. We've heard that, and, and I would address this to any of you who care to answer and tell you that. Uh, we've heard that uh, getting marijuana in a high school in Manchester, an illegal substance, is easier than getting cigarettes or beer in a jar or uh, regular. Is that your experience? Um, my experience of being a teacher, um, I don't know about the students, I know that Kids getting cigarettes. Kids getting <laughs> kids getting cigarettes is easier. Um, do drug deals happen in school bathrooms? Yes, they do. Um, I think you'll see an increase in that if this becomes a, a violation instead of a misdemeanor. Um, accessibility is a problem, I think, for tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, as well as prescription drugs. Thank you. Would any of you give an answer? Are you in the chair, please? Do you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to redirect the question to the rest of the room. Same question to any of the other participants. Let's make that part of one. I feel like students, if they want something, they know how to get it, and they will go to any extent to receive it. I have actually witnessed a transaction of cigarettes during my class in school right in front of me while I was in my Tilton Police Explorer uniform. And you can walk into the bathrooms at school and you can smell cigarette smoke when you go and throw away your towel from washing your hands. You can find butts in the trash in the school. So I feel like there's just unlimited ways to access. There's also a nickname for when you text. For I know for cocaine, it's you say, "Do you have any Smitty?" And that's how people know. And it's, yeah, I don't know any of the nicknames for other things, but I'm sure they're out there. Any further questions? We'll take that testimony if we give it to the representative. Okay, great. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you all. Great Thank job. You. Thank 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 you. Oh, and this was supposed to, there's only one copy of this one, this is the most recent one, so all the way down, yep. And I got out of the huge direction in the early Thank you, Chairman and, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Susan McKeown, I'm from 299 Dynas Drive. Thank you. I'm from uh, Manchester, 299 Dynas Drive. Um, and, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm coming to wear three hats today. Um, my first hat is as a parent um, of now four adult ad, uh, children, who, um, two of them who, as adolescents, have issues with marijuana use. Um, as a pediatric nurse practitioner for 40 years, 
Um, I have worked um, in a clinic with families, um, young people, teenagers, many of whom um, parents had substance issues. Um, and as a facilitator for FASTER, FASTER stands for Families Advocating Substance um, Education, Treatment, um, and Recovery. This is a parent group FASTER that meets every Tuesday evening in Manchester and several around the state. Um, I and my husband facilitate the one in Manchester. And this is for parents and caregivers whose um, teens and young adults have issues with alcohol and substances. Uh, this has destroyed many marriages and families um, watching the use of this. It not only has cost tens of thousands of dollars to the families that have been involved in trying to seek help, but it has also been responsible for a tremendous loss of productivity um, for cities and states, use of the judicial system, and missed education, because many of these kids do not finish high school. Marijuana is the most illegally used drug in the United States, and because of its accessibility, it is often viewed as innocuous. And that has come up in the previous testimonies. Attention tends to be focused on what's viewed as the more dangerous drugs, cocaine, heroin, the oxys. Um, and there isn't one family who has walked through our door in the last nine and a half years of parent groups whose children and young adults did not start with marijuana. Attitudes have softened about the risk of marijuana, and that's resulted in the stalling of a decline that we were seeing for 10 years when we do surveys on 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. For the last decade, there was a decline. The attitude um, of a much more laissez-faire attitude has tended to level that off. Uh, States where even medical marijuana has been legalized, like in Montana, have rethought their decision about the experience as they have seen an increase in usage in the general population. And because it has been viewed as less harmful, it creates an atmosphere that's more favorable to use. And again, I think that has been brought up very well in past testimonies. Facts from NIDA. NIDA is the National Institute of Drug Abuse certainly coincides with my years of personal and professional experience. That our marijuana use affects judgment, which can mean that there is a greater likelihood of engaging in dangerous activities, sexual activities resulting in pregnancies um, and uh, sexually transmitted diseases. And also for um, driving while intoxicated, riding with someone who's intoxicated, the car crashes and the loss of life that results from that. In addition to psychosis, chronic, mar chronic marijuana use is associated with a range of psychological effects, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and personality disturbances. We know a lot more about the brain, and it's out there, and if you plug into any of these things, you can see all the studies that have been done on the effects of the brain that is developing until 25, so when these teens are using it at 15, 16, 17, it is highly effective um, in their, their brain development in interfering with that. One of the most frequently cited effects of it is amotivational syndrome, which is just as the title says, describes a diminished or loss of interest in other activities that used to be considered rewarding. Kids lose their motivation. And if you talk with any kids, watch any kids, talk with teachers um, and people working with them, parents, um, they do lose the motivation to sometimes get to school, be involved in fun things that they used to enjoy. They quit sports teams. They don't show up for their jobs. A motivational syndrome is a very real thing with chronic pot use. Marijuana is addictive, and for chronic users, there are withdrawal symptoms. These symptoms are not life-threatening but they are so distressing that it often causes relapse, and as a result, chronic use tends to continue. The effects are physical, emotional, and mental well-being, and they deserve serious consideration as we look at a bill that is looking at legalizing another destructive drug. It concerns me when we look at this and say, you know, listen, these kids are gonna do uh, tobacco, they're gonna do alcohol, they do, let's just move it over there. It reminds me of a parent who's just been bullied down and finally says, fine, fine, do what you want. I think we as a society have to stand up for this and say, you know what, just because those two things are legalized, 
doesn't mean that we're supposed to just add to it. And I think that deserves our very strong attention. So to those who raise the issue about the cost of the legal society, incarceration, et cetera, I say look at this um, in terms of interventions. Um, some of uh, the, the ASAP program, adolescent substance abuse treatment programs are available. These are things that users should be diverted to not incarcerated, okay? But they still need to know that there's a penalty to this and that that's going to happen. And I think that uh, we should provide that just like we do with other chronic relapsing illnesses in our society. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, do you have any written testimony? Yeah, you have this. Have to have that. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Bob Constantine. Good afternoon. I hear, I, my name is Bob Ponson, I'm here uh, in support of this bill. Um, I think somebody mentioned earlier um, it's against federal law, but federal law does not prevent states from adjusting penalties. So decriminalizing is completely legal. Um, concerning the substance itself, a little bit away from uh, legal aspects of it. Uh, I had a poster earlier, and I apologize, one of the gentlemen was a little confused on what that poster that we have to turn around says. But, uh, at the top, it has the leading causes of death according to the U.S. Surgeon General's report. Well, tobacco is the leading cause of death as far as the substance itself. The second leading cause of death is alcohol. Then you go down through all of these other substances, caffeine and so forth. Um, alcohol is about, I don't know, 45 to 100,000 people per year. But you go all the way down to the bottom, and cannabis is at zero. Now, that's very interesting because people were alluding to the harm and all that. So I'm here to refute that. Um, and I have some other excerpts I want to read to you a bit later. Uh, cannabis does not cause cancer. I'm going to submit something here. It's called the Tashkin Report. This is a pulmonologist. Some of you heard from me uh, maybe a week or so ago at another hearing. Uh, so what he found was instead of uh, any association uh, with cancer, there's even a suggestion of some protective effect. Um, I'm going to submit that. Cannabis is not a gateway drug, according to a study conducted by a state school at the University of New Hampshire and another state school at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm going to submit that. As far as a message to children, well, I have three kids, and I certainly do not want them to engage in dangerous behavior. So if I were to believe the U.S. Surgeon General report, I'd probably say, hey, don't smoke cigarettes, don't consume alcohol, um, and you know, pay attention to the law, but it looks like cannabis isn't going to cause any death or anything like that. Um, as far as uh, what exists surrounding us, New Hampshire sits in the middle of a bunch of other states that have already either decriminalized, uh, have affirmed the medicinal properties, or done both. So I have information uh, on that that I'll submit. Um, it's a chart here that uh, shows the many states uh, that have already gone through this discussion and decided that uh, it was fine for people to own themselves. Um, I'd like to read something here. This debate's been going on for a long time, and we all know that. Um, there were uh, some studies that were presented to the DEA to uh, adjust the scheduling of this uh, back. And it, first, they didn't want to hear it. They wanted to sweep it under the table and all that. But finally, um, Judge Francis Young, he's an administrative law judge with the United States Drug Enforcement Agency. In 1988, after declaring uh, you know, all of this information was going to be uh, heard and evaluated, he came up with this. He said, in its natural form, cannabis, or marijuana, is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known. That's the DEA judge after he evaluated all the information. I'll submit that too. Um, I have a couple of other things, but I think I'm going to save them for the next hearing. Yeah, I'm open to any questions at this point. Any questions for this witness? Dr. Ginsburg. Thank you. Thank you. How do you respond to, to the uh, uh, claim that uh, extensive research shows that uh, smoking marijuana has uh, serious deleterious effects on young people? Um, 
Well, that claim uh, was, that spurious information that was put out there a long time ago, I think the latest reports, I, I have several other reports too, one by, just put out in 2012, two weeks ago, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association, long-term exposure to cannabis smoke is not associated with adverse effects on pulmonary function. So I don't necessarily explain that. I just go with the, uh, the scientists. And these aren't crackpot scientists. In this Tashkin report, he's a pulmonologist that the government used to like to use his studies when it supported them, but now he's come up with some other evidence and they want to sweep that under the rug. So thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, you can hand down testimony right sure. up. And, uh, okay. Okay. I'll, uh, at the uh, next, at the end of the next hearing, I'd like to hand that Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Major Russ Conti. Thank you, sir, members of the committee. I do have some written testimony I'd like to hand out also. Okay. Major, Major Russ Conti from State Police. Um, I'm here representing the Department of Safety, and I've been uh, a member of the Division of State Police for 27 years, going on 28 years. Um, dear honorable members of the committee, this bill provides any person who possesses less than one ounce of marijuana should be guilty of a violation and subject to a fine up to $100. Currently, any amount of marijuana results in a Class A misdemeanor. To date, in 2011, the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory has received over 7,000 requests for controlled drug analysis. While the actual quantities of marijuana are not currently tracked, it is estimated that approximately two-thirds of these cases, less than 3,500, involve less than one ounce of marijuana. Those include loose vegetation, rolled cigarettes, food containing marijuana, partially burnt cigarettes, and smoking devices such as pipes or bongs. To date, the, le the forensic laboratory has received over 2,000 subpoenas for drug cases, and approximately 75% of those, less than 1,500, involve less than one ounce of marijuana. This resulted in a lab analysis analysts traveling to court over 100 times, expending hundreds of hours of waiting to testify, and witnessing a plea bargain and arraignment upon arrival at court. The reason those statistics are in there um, ladies and gentlemen, just to show you the, the scope of what the problem is. We can all argue how much this costs to do, but the real reality is 7,000 requests. And I will also uh, remind you, those are the people that were caught. It's unclear if the laboratory testing would still be required for a violation offense, or if, law or if a law enforcement officer would be required to be adequately trained as an expert to determine whether the green vegetative matter found during an investigative or traffic stop is in fact marijuana. This would perhaps require pocket scales of all law enforcement officers so they can ascertain the quality or quantity of marijuana for charging purposes. If laboratory testing will still be required, there will be no impact on the expenditures of forensic laboratories. Since lab analysts would continue to test and testify in these cases, whether it's a violation case or a class A estimate. And I will also remind you that uh, there is a, many instances where law enforcement officers are categorized as experts for purposes of best evidence. In other words, there's not many law enforcement officers that come in and say, it looked like that, so I say it is because I received training. That's why lab personnel come in, and they're certainly bolstered by scientific instrumentation that allows them to, to not only through their observations, but through scientific results. It should be pointed out that one ounce of marijuana is 28.35 grams. The average hand-rolled marijuana cigarette analyzed at the forensic laboratory is less than 0.5 grams of marijuana. With the average count that a person could make over 50 hand-rolled cigarettes with one ounce of marijuana, the criminal downgrading of marijuana possession based upon the amount is not sound public policy and is definitely a threat to society. By somehow suggesting that a little marijuana in one's possession is less important than more than one ounce, the wrong message is being sent to society since it has been proven to, have, to be a problematic drug and a gateway drug, and we've heard testimony in both. This is the New Hampshire Department of Safety opposes the bills for all those reasons. 
you have written testimony, sir, that we can have in? Uh, I did, sir. Oh. I passed it around. Uh, <coughs> all right. Any questions for the, for the mayor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, according to this, you have 2,000 subpoenas for drug cases and uh, process 7,000. 7,000 requests. 7,000 requests, which means there's probably a considerable amount more. My question is, how much does that cost to provide that service? Oh, it's a considerable sum, <coughs> sir. I think that what I submit to you is not only does it outline what the problem is, is that if it's, if it's brought to a violation level, I don't know if, uh, if anybody's just going to concede to a police officer being able to, to issue you uh, whatever court action it is just based on his knowledge. There's a lot of things that look like marijuana, I can tell you that. So what I'm going to tell you is that, unfortunately, I think this is still going to be an, an issue for the forensic lab. You're still going to have to have evidence, uh, scientific evidence, of what, of what the, the drug is, irregardless. So uh, I, you know, there's a possibility that that 7,000 number increases. And the reason I say that is if it's decriminalized, people are probably going to figure out, I can get in less trouble for this, so they'll carry it around more. So you can actually, by decriminalizing this marijuana, you can increase those numbers. And the cost could be greater. I mean, we can't say, but if it's an evidence issue, you know you're going to get at least, you know, a, a substantial number each year that have to be analyzed. Follow up. Follow up. Wouldn't it be true, though, that if this were a violation, these people would only receive the ticket in none of these cases would make it to the, to the uh, drug analysis? Well, uh, if you're going to charge somebody with a violation, you still have to have evidence of what you're charging them for. So what I'm here to tell you is that's part of the problem. Is it going to be recognized that a law enforcement officer has the expert ability to say, this green vegetative matter that's loose in your pocket is marijuana, here's your ticket. Are they going to be able to do that, or are they going to have to take it? Are they going to have to take it, issue a ticket, and get it submitted to the lab? And then if, in fact, it is, follow through with it. I mean, that's the question. The question is whether or not they're going to be able to, to say absolutely positively, that's marijuana, here's your ticket. And frankly, if, if I was a young person, and we know there's a lot of things out there that look like marijuana that aren't, and you had something that wasn't marijuana, and an officer even gave you a $100 fine for it, are you just going to pay the fine? It's the equivalent if you're, if you're uh, a motor vehicle violation happened and you didn't do it, you're probably going to want to come to court. You're probably going to want to say, hey, the system is, I get to say my piece. So I don't think, I don't think at all, in my experience, that it's going to be, you know, the fix that everybody's looking for, frankly. Um, I just don't think it is. Um, Major, we've heard the testimony here today that it's a year in jail and a $2,000 fine with someone caught with marijuana. That, could you tell me how many of them cases that really go to Ma'am, I don't know of one case where somebody with a small amount of marijuana has done a year in jail and paid $2,000. And frankly, I think you've heard testimony, and, uh, and I, I appreciate everybody coming in. The norm is more of this. Most counties, if not every county, has a program to help young offenders. And frankly, the reason that they're helped is because they got there. They got into the program. And young people, as we know, have different ideas on stuff. And, and, and obviously, we're all young at one time, and you think differently. The realities of it is, is nobody, no law enforcement officer wants to ruin a kid's life because he has a small amount of marijuana, or she does. That's not what we're about. Now, are we going to get? Are we going to take action? Yes, it's illegal. Is that action probably going to be an eye-opening experience for the person? Yes. But when it comes to a year in jail and two thousand dollars, you're talking probably about somebody that's selling it, that's not just carrying a small amount. And I can tell you that I've been on both sides of that. I worked in the drug unit. I worked undercover. I've, I've done all sides of it. And I can tell you, even for sales of marijuana. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't each and every time you got a one to three in state prison. Many times there were lesser sentencing and please work out. But I think, I think the people that have submitted the programs that are in the state and what the problems are, and I will attest to how it affects families. It affects families greatly. If you have a child that gets, that's involved in drugs, you're not going to condone it. Just like you wouldn't condone anything that's not good for their health, irregardless of it. But it does affect families. You can think about how that impacts people. You don't raise your children to do things that are illegal. It doesn't mean they can't make a mistake, and it doesn't mean that us as law enforcement officers in the state think that these kids should be hung up by their toes. We don't. 
but there has to be a mechanism to deal with it to hopefully help the decision making process for young people. And if we remove that, you know, where are we? What, what, are, what, are, what else are we going to condone in society? It becomes a safety issue. One more thing I'll add is this. Thank as you. far as that's with marijuana, if I can just expound a little bit. Um, as far as smoking marijuana, I agree. I don't know of anybody that's died from just smoking marijuana, but I can tell you this. I've been to a few car accidents that were fatalities, more than a few, where the people were smoking marijuana. So you tell me whether it added to it or not, and those were deaths. So they didn't die from smoking marijuana, they died from being impaired from smoking marijuana. Yes, you Following on the, the, the panel officer's question and, and, and your response, if, if, the, if the law says it's a $2,000 fine and a year in jail, but that never happens, why wouldn't what happens actually be what we should have in statute? Because you want to leave, you, you do want to leave leeway for, for uh, just like any violation, it's punishable up to $1,000. There should be leeway. There's different levels of it. If you have somebody that's come in on several violations, you may have a judge that said, you know what? Usually the fine, I would be around $250. This is egregious. Mr. Smith, I've seen you here three other times. You're going to pay $1,000. You're going to get into this program. It gives the judges some leeway. And I, I don't think that has to be changed. But I think, uh, I think the district courts, all courts in the state, recognize fully what they're dealing with when young people come in for, for drug use and small amount possession cases. I think they're well on board with it. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, sir. Rich Angel? Well, I support the bill, but only because I see it as a baby step in the right direction. If we live in a free country, such as America's reported to be, if we live in a free state, such as New Hampshire purports to be, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Because after all, in a free state, there's no such thing as big brother society, a fictitious concept, by the way, telling us what we can or can't or should or should be putting in our own bodies. We've had a lot of discussion about the dangers of marijuana versus other drugs. But there's one thing that hasn't come up, and that is the danger of marijuana <coughs> compared to the danger of police activity. Let's not stick with police activity. Let's stick to the body of the bill. Okay, marijuana be decriminalized and no speak to that. Well, we've had somebody coming in here representing the state of New Hampshire complaining that this bill would make it more difficult for the police to enforce marijuana laws, as if that were a bad thing. Protecting individual liberties, protecting individual rights, is everything in a free country. Your job is not to make it easier for the police to oppress the people, break down doors and, and raid houses, and, and uh, all the things that they do is to protect our rights. Government kills far more people than drugs. And about this gateway thing, I, we, had, we, we had people in here saying that, that when the, uh, these people, these criminals who use hard drugs, etc., they started with marijuana. Well, guess what? I'll bet if you were to go to the worst prisons and talk to Hell's Angels and Mongols, these motorcycle riding hooligans will probably tell you that they all started with tricycles and bicycles. But we don't talk about making those illegal, do we? No. Individuals in a free country make their own decisions, and when they see that something is harming them, they quit. I've met several people who used to smoke marijuana who simply quit because it was no longer serving them, and they had no apparent difficulty in doing so. So remember, freedom live free or die state, don't listen to the bureaucrats who are here telling us how to, how to make their job easier to oppress the people. Thank you. Any questions from this week? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Greg Pulaski. 
Yeah, I'm going to keep it down more than the last night. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for hearing me. Uh, some of you might recall I was here last week to testify to testify on the tax and regulate bill. And I'm in favor of the bill. Decriminalization uh, basically limits the uh, penalties for the most uh, needed that need protecting. And what I mean by that is not just children. You're also talking about vets. You're talking about sick people. And you're talking uh, regarding uh, parents and, and so on and so forth. Um, this, this bill for decriminalization is in your power to basically quantify and to delegate the resources for what New Hampshire can, uh, can uh, in initialize uh, penalties. Um, according to the Attorney General's reports, the 2011 biannual uh, Department of Justice report, proceeds go 45% of the seizing agencies, 45% goes to drug forfeitures, and 10% drug to drug treatments. These these bills or cannabis legislation currently that criminalize this activity is a huge money-making opportunity, not just for the states, but also for the federal government, and also for the, for the police departments in, in, in tow. Uh, last year, according to the Drug Task Force uh, reports, uh, there were 2,116 criminal cases, an 18% increase from the last report, which is, again comes out every two years, in which there were 321 arrests. They confiscated $217,656, three automobiles, one house, and 94 weapons. Confiscated off the, off the streets was 129 pounds of cannabis, 12 and a half pounds of cocaine, six ounces of crack cocaine, five and one quarter ounces of heroin, 4,700 Oxycontin pills, 4,341 prescription depressants, 1,519 ecstasy pills, 36 methadone pills, and seven and a half grams of crystal meth. We're using far more resources for marijuana and marijuana cases than in anything else. There is a huge, huge disproportionate problem with pharmaceutical drugs. Now, of course, that might be a completely different bill. But when we're talking about youth usage, and just like, and I, and I applaud the efforts of the, of the students for coming in here and stating what they choose. And they have that right to choose. There's no one taking that away from them. The state has no right to take that away from them either. But unfortunately, there is a huge, huge <coughs> misuse or mischaracterization of cannabis versus other drugs, whether or not they be legal or illegal. Prescription drugs are a huge, huge problem. There are far more, far more misuse me, of those. I understand that. And with, all, and with all due respect, we're talking about illegal drugs in total. No, no, no. So what is cannabis? Oh, oh, cannabis? Cannabis is marijuana. Okay. Back in 1937, uh, the American Medical Association, as well as numerous, a lot of doctors actually, all knew marijuana as cannabis. Marijuana is actually a, uh, a, a word given to this particular plant that is incredibly racist. It was... Okay, sir, I think you've explained we don't like cannabis as marijuana. No, she did. No, so, I didn't do you just... I, I'm to, looking at a bill that says marijuana. Sure. The discrimi this discrimination is, is completely rampant. The NAACP, as well as Latino groups, all uh, have signed resolutions to sir, basically... Sir, please keep in mind the bill. Just, just address marijuana. All right. And what this, what this bill will do if enacted. Sure. What this bill will do, if enacted, will basically help safeguard our communities, protect our most vulnerable veterans, parents, and kids. All right. That is what you have to look at. All right. And I apologize for getting a little bit out of topic, but this is a multifaceted, dual complex issue. This is not just a fine line of cannabis versus other drugs. This is a huge, huge money-making opportunity for the government. The state of New Hampshire receives $29 million annually from the federal government for programs such as drug prevention, drug interdiction, as well as other proceeds for, uh, for rehabilitation. The amount of money that this state is using to facilitate this egregious attempt against marijuana needs to be stopped and needs to be readdressed. Thank you. Go ahead. Are you addressing the bill? Or are you addressing the amendment? 
I just saw the amendment today, and I'm, personally, myself, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, of the amendment. I, the D-trim bill was set at $100, and I represent the I, I, I saw the amendment to get it through the process. However, the decriminalization, I liked it at the $100 mark. The $250 is an is a artificial fee based upon what the legislature would be willing to pay get pass through the legislature. I'm not, I'm not a huge supporter of, of artificial uh, manipulation. Absolutely. My question would be to you. You would, you would stay with $100 and make sure that the bill probably wouldn't go through? Or would you, well, would course, you compromise? Oh, yeah, I would compromise. Thank um, you. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that the amendment's not worth it. I'm just saying what personally my choice is and what I personally would like to see is the other. However, to get it through the committee and get it through to the House floor and get it to the Senate, I would say compromise is appropriate. Thank you. All right? That's what I would say. I have a comment. Would you believe that internal possession of alcohol for someone under 21 years of age, you know, you can't, 0.02 I believe it is, that it's a $300 penalty plus plus $300 fine plus a penalty assessment of $60. It comes up to $360. This does penalty for internal possession, so this would be less. My question to you, sir, is we no, you don't, you don't no. question me. No. Okay, so just make a comment if you wish. Well, I don't know what that has to do with this bill. I'm just, we're, we're talking money here, right? Talking penalty. You're talking penalty? Yeah, right. For internal possession of alcohol, it would be higher than this penalty. So, what would be wrong with this monetary penalty? For this? Again, I am personally myself. I am not for artificial uh, infringement upon a person's right to choose. That's just, that's my personal opinion. Now, if if you were to ask me, you know, am I in favor of? If you're asking me, well, am I in favor of fighting and, and penalizing people, the answer to the question is no. But if you're saying as a compromising aspect to a piece of legislation, I would have to say in every piece of legislation, every bill, there needs to be baby steps to get things covered. And this is an appropriate first measure, yes. Will it be addressed later if it does happen to become law? Yes. Will I make sure I do that? Yes. Sir, to the best of your knowledge, how many people have died on overdoses of marijuana? Zero. There are more people that die annually from peanuts than they do on cannabis. And I, and I say cannabis because that's the actual legal term for it. Follow up. How often do people get into violent confrontations after smoking marijuana? Hmm, that's a really good question. And unfortunately, I don't have the appropriate uh, response to that question. However, um, there are attorney generals who have been on record um, videotape uh, at a, last week at a uh, drug seminar in Detroit, Michigan, that the attorney general who uh, is no longer there, his name is Michael Cox, said that in his course of action of prosecuting over 20 years worth of uh, criminal activity in the city of Detroit, that it has very rarely will there be physical abuse from cannabis users on their wives or their children. So from a political answer, I have to say that from a politician who's an attorney general who was elected voter for eight years, that holds a lot of credibility and a lot of a lot of you know, a lot of a lot of problems. Thank you. No further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Amy Pepin. Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is um, Amy Pepin. I'm policy director at New Futures. Um, we are an organization seeking to reduce alcohol and other drug problems in New Hampshire. Um, and uh, we are, in fact, opposed to decriminalization. Um, and uh, having heard a lot of discussion for and against today, I'm going to try and really briefly summarize. Um, uh, yes, brief. I am good at this. So, um, 
So we're hearing a lot of comparisons to alcohol. We're hearing a lot of comparisons to other um, legal drugs, perhaps prescription drugs, perhaps other kinds of drugs. I would um, submit to you that young people in New Hampshire have significant problems with those drugs. Significant problems, higher than the national average with alcohol and with prescription medications. Um, also with marijuana. <coughs> But we're talking about legislation which will potentially um, uh, provide young people with a reinforcement of a, something they dearly, dearly want to believe. Dearly want to believe. <laughs> Is that um, marijuana it has no harmful effects. It, it cannot cause dependency and is in fact uh, better than alcohol. Because, you know, people drink and sometimes they get mean. Um, and they smoke pot and usually they don't. And young people experience that. And they learn from that. And they say, oh, all right. If I wouldn't get in so much trouble, I wouldn't mind doing that. So I would submit to you that what we know in prevention science, and there's science to prevention of problems with alcohol and other drugs, what we know in prevention science is that in states where decriminalization and or medical marijuana laws have passed, the perception of risk of harm among young people, they're saying, oh, this must not be a bad thing since you can't really get in trouble when you do it. So the perception of risk of harm goes down like this. And youth use goes up like this. It's inversely proportional. And you can see it on the charts. Now, why do we care if you use more marijuana? Um, I would submit to you because it has impact on their development. Um, we know there's very good science that shows us that it has impact on their development, as does alcohol, as do other foreign substances introduced into the body, particularly during adolescence, which is a time of brain growth. It's also a, um, a time of brain, um, oh gosh, I want to say shedding, and that's not the right word. But it's when we kind of carve some of the permanent neurological pathways in our brain. Um, it's not a time when we should be introducing foreign substances into our body. So fine. So this law, and in particular this amendment, would say don't do it if you're under 18 years old, right? So currently we say for alcohol, don't do it if you're under 21 years old. But we have a significant underage alcohol use problem in New Hampshire. Um, which we've worked really, really hard to address through prevention and treatment programming. Um, and we've seen that rate come down a little smidge with a huge investment. All of that investment in prevention is gone. Prevention programming in New Hampshire for young people, adolescents, or young people, 18 to 24, say, doesn't really exist. We don't have it. What is the program that you're going to call up and send them to? This amendment doesn't say treatment program. It says education program. And I would submit to you that's a problem as well. So to summarize, we are opposed because what we will see, we strongly believe that what we will see, because of the relationship, that inverse relationship, between perception of harm <coughs> and use, that we will see something very similar to what we see among 18 to 24 year olds with alcohol. 75% of young people in New Hampshire, 18 to 24 years old, use alcohol. Which for most of them is fine, but for a significant chunk of them is illegal. 75%. What's our data on marijuana? Almost 40% of 18 to 25 year olds currently in New Hampshire are using marijuana. I would submit to you that we need to think about whether we want that to be 75%. That's why New Hampshire's is opposed. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And last, if I get this right, Kirk McNeil? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for hearing me. I have something that I'll start these around the uh, edges so that you guys can look at it. My name is Kurt McNeil. 
and I'm here on behalf of New Hampshire Common Sense. We represent uh, citizens advocating a sensible reform of drug laws, particularly marijuana legislation. I'm here in support of this bill. Surprise. Um, we've heard a lot of impassioned testimony today. And I want to speak directly to the bill, but I do want to address a couple of things that have come up very briefly. One, there's been a lot of talk about the problems of abuse. Abuse of cigarettes, tobacco, abuse of alcohol, abuse of marijuana, abuse of other drugs. This bill isn't arguing that we should advocate the abuse of anything. It's advocating Article 18, that the penalties should fit the crime. We've had testimony from the major sitting here already today saying that the penalties don't fit the crime and that they are often adjusted downward. It's wonderful that that happens. However, you as the representatives and hopefully the Senate later on have the opportunity to actually make the penalties fit the crime. That's your job. Their job is to prosecute or uncover the offenses. Your job is to set the law that they can follow. And I would ask you to do that. I'm going to give you a couple of statistics just very briefly. Um, but obviously, I support the bill. I think the fine is too high. The marijuana laws that we currently have them aren't working. They cost taxpayers an estimated $7.7 billion a year, and they keep police from focusing on real crimes. All that time that the forensic labs are tied up, they're not in the process of processing rape evidence or burglary evidence or other violent crimes with real victims. We've had a lot of testimony where people talk about there are no abuse programs, there are no programs to help people get over abusive situations or problems where they become dependent on substances, marijuana or otherwise. But those very same people are advocating that we spend a lot of money on enforcement as opposed to actually getting programs up and running. Obviously, the bill doesn't address that, but if it did, we'd be hearing this in the Health and Human Services Committee and not in the Criminal Justice Committee. There's a reason you guys are divided up into committees. This part's yours. Um, every year, more arrests are made for marijuana possession than for all violent crimes combined. And we may not want someone to use marijuana, but I really don't want people raped, murdered, and having their possession stolen from them. And I would like law enforcement to focus on those things as opposed to marijuana. Marijuana prohibition has caused a lot more harm than marijuana use itself. We've heard testimony from the kids uh, today and from their teacher that they believe fear is the way to keep people from using something that might potentially damage their bodies. Whether it's marijuana or tobacco or alcohol, I would advocate to you today the way to keep people from doing things to harm themselves is to educate them. And it saddens me that our education system is trying to use fear instead of facts. Mm -hmm. I passed some facts out to you today. Just to address those really quickly. I'm just going to use the first page because as you read through this, you'll see the rest of the information bears itself out. Mississippi and Alabama. Without belaboring the facts because you have them in front of you, we have a state, Mississippi, where a possession of 30 grams or less of marijuana is punishable by a fine of $100 to $250 for the first offense, no arrest under most circumstances, and the fine is doubled for subsequent offenses. In Alabama, a neighboring state, possession of any amount of marijuana under one kilogram is an arrestable criminal offense punishable up to one year in jail and a fine of up to $6,000. You can see the parallels here between the proposed bill and the existing law. Obviously, it's not an apples to apples comparison but you can see the fruit aisle from here. When these laws were enacted, teen use in Mississippi declined, and it went up in Alabama. These are the facts. That's all I have to say, unless you have any questions. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the audience wishing to speak who had not previously spoken? Seeing now that I close this hearing on HB 1526.